seated. We're going to be in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14 this morning. I want to go ahead and get a show of hands. How many of you are actually conscious? How many of you are awake? All right. How many of you are like me? You set your alarm for 6 o'clock because you knew you weren't going to wake up on your own, but somehow in a half-conscious state you hit the snooze button and you woke up at 7 o'clock and had to take the fastest shower of your whole life. Okay. That's pretty much how it happened. Uh, But this morning, we're so glad to have you here with us. Many of you have been asking, how is Brother Steve? Our pastor is doing a lot better this week. Uh, I think right now he's even off his pain meds, so he's he's feeling that good. Uh, But would encourage you to please keep him and Miss Tynell still in your prayer because he's going to have a lot of physical therapy, and uh, that's not a whole lot of fun, but it is part of it. So just continue to uh, be in prayer for him, and please give him time to rest. Uh, He's going to be with us in the second service. Uh, So all those who overslept, they'll get to see him, okay? Sorry. You overachievers in the first service, you might not get to see him. Uh, But he he does covet your prayers, and we are so glad to have him uh, on the men. But we are going to be in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, and we are going to be looking at this question of are we buried in sin or are we raised to freedom? Are we buried in sin or are we raised to freedom? Because I don't know about you, but there are some days I feel much like David in the Psalms. It says, God, my... My sin is always before me. It's like no matter what you do, everything seems to fall apart. And everything you try to do, even with the best intentions, you never follow through with. And you always seem to be stumbling against this block called sin. Even though you might be saved, even though you might be a deacon, even though you might have been living a Christ-like life, it seems like sin can strike without a moment's notice and it can wreak havoc. And sometimes we, we fall into this really tough situation where we start to say, well, am I even saved, you know, because I thought if you're saved, you don't sin anymore. You know, I don't know about you, but I've struggled with that in my heart. And I've said, well, God, how is it that we can be saved from the penalty of sin? How is it that we can be saved and raised into newness of life in Jesus Christ, but we still struggle with sin? What is the word God has for us as believers who are struggling with that. And so we're going to be looking at that in Romans 6. Remember uh, that we talked about the book of Romans basically hinges on two words, and those two words are King Jesus. In the book of Romans, Paul is making his case to Jews, to Gentiles, to the entire world that Jesus is King. And we're not just talking about of some geographical location. We are talking about all heaven, all earth. He holds the keys to death and hell. Jesus rules over all. All And so in chapter 2, we talked about how Paul looked at the religious crowd and said, Many of you think that because of all the laws you keep, that is going to save you. He says, No, we are saved by grace through faith. And then at the same time in chapter 4, he goes and he counters some of their arguments. They said, Well, if we're saved by grace through faith, we don't have to do anything. All we got to do is keep sinning and sinning and sinning, and that's going to mean God pours out more and more grace. And who doesn't want more of that good stuff? And Paul says, no, if you're actually saved, you are going to be living a life different than you used to. And not because you're super special, but because the Spirit of God works within you. And at the same time, it's still going to be all about grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And so now in chapter 6, Paul is finishing up his argument. And he's actually going to start explaining this is how it works out in the life of a child of God. And so if you're one of God's children here this morning, I would encourage you to perk your ears and be listening. And there are, uh, statistically speaking, there are going to be people in this group this morning who are not children of God. Maybe you've been in church your whole life. Maybe you've been to every VBS between Hurley and Escatabo, okay? You've had more Kool-Aid and cookies than any of those older church ladies thought was ever possible without bursting, okay? But guess what? Going to church doesn't make us saved. But it can awaken our hearts to our need for the Savior. And so this morning, this message is for you as well. But we are going to be reading in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. It says, What will we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means. How can he, we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into his death? And then while we were buried, therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought 
to nothing. And so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Amen. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion or power over Him. For the death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, and so make you obey its passions. Do not present your members as sin, to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as though you have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion or power over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. And all of God's people said, amen. and not just an amen, we're talking about amen. amen. I mean, this is the crux of the gospel. Paul has finally gotten past all these little arguments because everybody's like, well, you said this, so doesn't that mean I can get away with anything because God's such a loving father? And he's like, no, that's wrong. You're totally messed up because if you're really one of God's legitimate children, you are going to listen to your daddy or he's going to whoop you until you do listen to him, okay? So Paul has already made it through all these little arguments with the Gentiles. He's made it through all these little arguments with the Jews and now he's getting to the point. He says, if you want to know how this works and if you want to know how awesome the gospel is, he says, let's get going in chapter 6. We're going to be looking at three things that we need to know about in Romans chapter 6. But the first thing we're going to talk about is this quote from Charles Spurgeon. It says, if Christ is not all to you, he is nothing to you. Let that marinate for a while. If Christ is not all to you, he is nothing to you. He will never go into partnership as a part of a Savior for men. If he be something, he must be everything. But if he be not everything, he is nothing to you. And that's essentially what Paul is getting to. He's saying you don't mix and match Jesus. You don't throw a lot of legalism in as long as you keep all the laws right and you get a little bit of Jesus, then you're good. He says, no, you were saved by grace through faith. If you tried to keep all 800 and something laws of the Old Testament, if you never let fried catfish pass between your lips, if you never wore a cotton and polyester blend, if you never murdered anybody, if you kept all 800 something laws in the Old Testament, Paul says, guess what? You still would not be good enough. And at the same time, he says, you might be saying, well, since Jesus saves us and we're saved by grace, then that means I can do whatever I want. There doesn't have to be a change in my heart. I can still sleep around. I can still do drugs. I can still tell God thanks, but no thanks. I'm going to do whatever I want. And Paul says, no, you're wrong. Because the Spirit of God is within you at the moment of salvation. And therefore, from that moment, you are going to be instantly changed. Not that you'll instantly know everything you as a believer need to know. Not that you're instantly going to be uh, free of all sinful desires because that's what chapter 6 is going to be discussing. How do we still function as believers while we still struggle with some of these sins? But at the same time, there must be a marked difference in the life of a believer for you to be a believer. So, we are going to be walking through this. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 14. First thing we want to look at, what is removed? What is removed with Jesus' death on the cross? And you might be saying, well, Brother Dustin, we all know that. Every child knows that. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. So we're not going to uh, be held accountable to the penalty of sin. We're not going to have to die. You know, we might die a physical death, but we're going to be raised in heaven. You know, why are we going through this? We're going through this simply because sound theology... Sound theology helps put a troubled mind at ease. And I don't know about you, but there are many days when I wake up and my mind and my heart are troubled. One such case happened when I was 18 years old. I walked onto the campus of Southeastern Louisiana University, home of the Lions, uh, in Hammond, Louisiana. And I'll never forget, there was a huge gathering in the quad. You know, most uh, campuses have a quad, a student union, and that's where they give away all kind of free stuff, free food. They have bands. And so anytime you see a bunch of people, because you're a poor, starving college student, you run because you're hoping to get something more than just ramen noodles, okay? And so I, I run over there, and there's some of my friends. I'm like, hey, what's going on? They said, man, I don't know, but there is a stage, and they got 
got three coffins on the stage. And I'm like, I, I don't, maybe I should go boil some ramen noodles. I don't know. This is a little sketchy. What, what's going on? And before you know it, there was this guy dressed in solid black. He had tattoos down both his arms. He had long black hair. He looked like he weighed about 350 pounds, like he was some pro wrestler or something. And he got up and he said, how many of you have ever heard about Jesus? And, you know, in South Louisiana, we're like, well, you know. Who doesn't know about Jesus? Everybody's heard about him. Everybody's been forced to go to church at some point. Doesn't mean we're all saved, but we're all here. You know, we know what you're talking about. And next thing you know, he starts to launch into this discussion that if you have ever sinned, you're going straight to hell. And I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, that's what I've heard in church my whole life. That, that makes sense. If you've sinned, you're going to hell. And he says, even if you claim to be saved, if you've ever sinned, after you've asked Jesus into your heart, you're condemned to go to hell. And at that point, I took a step back and said, wait a minute. So you're telling me that if I sin after I'm saved, I'm going to hell? And I had never heard that. But you could see everyone in the crowd start to go, wait a minute, what? You mean we're... I mean, I was saved at five years old. You know, I had a friend, he was saved at five years old, and he was talking about, well, well, that means I'm going to hell, man. I'm already, I mean, what can I do? I'm, I'm, I don't know what that means. And me, I was saved when I was 12 years old, and I was thinking, well, man, my hormones weren't even kicking in at 12 years old yet. So, man, I, I've definitely sinned since then. There's things I've struggled with I never even knew I'd struggle with. And before you know it, you know, the, the lids fall off these three coffins and these three other guys who are huge and covered in tattoos step out in solid black and they start just shouting and hollering and talking about how all of us are going to hell. And, and even afterwards, some of us, we, we talked to him and said, wait a minute, what about King David? He was a man after God's own heart and time after time after time he messed up. And they said, yeah, he's in hell. And I was like, man, I don't know what to believe anymore. Because this was a, a very emotional presentation of the gospel, if you want to call it that. And they were quoting some Bible verses that I had heard of before. And I said, well, the way they're presenting it seems to make it sound like if you, if you sin after you're saved, you're not really saved and you're going straight to hell. And that caused me to dig into God's word. That caused me to call uh, on my father who's a pastor. It caused me to call on my youth pastor uh, who was trying to help me go through some things at that point in my life. And you might be saying, well, Brother Dustin, I, I've never been confronted with that. Well, I'm guaranteeing you that you've been confronted with sin in your heart as a believer, right? And you yourself have looked in the mirror and said, wait a minute, was Jesus' death, was it really enough? Because... I still struggle with sin each day. And, and God, did, did I, was I fake when I, when I cried out to you that night and gave you my everything? God, am, am, I still, am I still following you or is there some part of me that's unrepentant? Am I, am I just playing a game and I'm going to be one of those that when I wake up in heaven, you're going to be saying, no, depart from me, go to hell, I never knew you. In Romans 6, we find the basis of of our faith and our salvation. And we find assurance in the life of the believer. Because from the very beginning, Paul starts off, what is removed with Christ's death on the cross? What is accomplished? What is finished? What is put to rest when our Savior climbed onto the cross for your sins and for mine and for the sins of all humanity? The first thing we see is the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is forever buried with the death of Jesus on the cross. From the very beginning, he says, don't you know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Verse 6, our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin be brought to nothing. Get this, people. When we cry out to God because His Spirit's already been pulling on our heart and bringing us closer to Him, sin is destroyed. Halfway through Isaiah, God speaks to the prophet and He says, Get this, I, God, even the God of the universe, will blot out your transgressions and choose to remember them no more. 
Listen, I know many of you are parents in here and you love your children. And you might even have forgiven your children of some of the terrible mistakes they've made in their life. But I guarantee you, you probably haven't forgotten it. Because even we as flawed humans, we tend to remember the things that hurt us and that are a danger to our families. But get this, the God of the universe is so huge and the salvation that comes from Jesus Christ is so powerful that sin is obliterated. Satan cannot come up on the day of judgment and say, listen, Brother Mitch, back when he was 13, he did this, therefore he is mine. Jesus steps up and says, no, 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 no. In 33 AD, I shed every drop of blood on that cross for him. He is mine. Listen, believer, that brings us joy. That brings us hope. That brings us some calm assurance, even though we might be struggling with sin. Notice it doesn't say that we all of a sudden lose our desire to sin. You got that? It's not that we just all of a sudden lose our desire to sin. Because we are still growing in sanctification. We are still becoming more like Jesus each day. So each day we're going to struggle still against some of the sin. It might even seem like the sin in your life grows in its magnitude. But that's because the Spirit of God is pointing it out even more. You ever notice that someone who has a really bad addiction, they don't think they have a bad addiction? You know, there are some people that struggle with pornography really bad and they say, well, you know... I, I can stop this anytime I want, and it's not doing any harm to anybody. I had many of my friends, when they became seniors in high school, they started getting addicted to painkillers and drugs and alcohol. And I remember seeing them, even though they might be passed out on the side of the road, even though they would come dragging in on Sunday morning because their parents forced them to, and they'd be like half conscious. And they, you would say, why are you doing this? You're throwing away your football career. You're throwing away your relationships. You're throwing away your scholarships to go to college. And they would say, listen, it's no big deal. I've got this under control. The whole point is we can't handle those things. We have a sin addiction that reaches all the way from the Garden of Eden and comes right to our front door every day. But the beautiful thing is the penalty of sin has been handled once and for all by the atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And because of that, because of that, Paul says not only the penalty, but guess what? We are no longer slaves to sin. Get this, any of you ever dealt with a two or three year old? How many of you have had to teach them how to be bad? Where are some of our children workers at? Do you have to teach the children in your class to be bad? They're like, oh, bless their hearts. No, that's just Baptist church ladies speak for, yeah, they're bad, okay? You know, let, let's face it, most little children, you don't have to teach them what's wrong. You've got to teach them what's right. Well, listen, that's because from the very beginning they have that sin nature in them. But as soon as we are changed by the blood of Jesus Christ, Paul says we have died to sin. We are raised into newness of life with Jesus. Just like Jesus died on that cross, it's like our old self. Our old self that had no hope but to follow Satan because he was our father. Because we had that sin nature in us. He says, guess what? All of a sudden, just like Christ died on that cross and Christ died to sin, we die to sin. And you might be saying, wait a minute. Why in the world, why in the world, in verse 9, does Paul make this point that Christ died to sin and was raised from it? Does that mean Jesus, he sinned? No. Paul's saying, just like in Hebrews chapter 6, that guess what? Jesus was tempted just like each of us. He felt every temptation we did, and yet he never sinned. That means that Jesus himself had some of that sin nature. He was tempted. But get this, he was not mastered by sin. And just like Christ struggled with that temptation, but when he was resurrected, he had that new heavenly body that even the women at the tomb saw right when he was raised. Guess what? That, that same thing is true for us. We are no longer slaves to sin. We now have options. We now have the option to follow Jesus Christ. But it's not so much an option that we just pick A or B. It's we either are slave to Satan in our old self or we are slaves to Christ in our new selves. Because just as Christ died and was buried and raised, so too are we 
as believers, when we cry out to God in the darkness and we say, Jesus, I need you to save me, I need you to change me, I need you to make me new from the inside out, and you're the only one who can do that. I'm tired of trying things on my own. Jesus, I want you more than anything. When that happens, we are instantly filled with the Holy Spirit and we are buried with Christ. That old us, that old Dustin that kept struggling with sin and saw no way out, that kept struggling with shame and condemnation, and there was nothing Dustin could do to fix it, that old Dustin is buried in the dirt. And then we are given a new way. We are given a new path. We are given a new life. And so Paul is trying to make the case that once you are a child of God, you are no longer a slave. You do not have to obey your old master because your new master is so much greater than the old. For who has died has been set free from sin. When Christ died on the cross and was raised three days later, the scriptures tell us that he descended into hell and he took the keys of death and hell from Satan himself. That means we no longer cower in fear because of what our sin is doing to us. We no longer cower in fear awaiting the day of our destruction because that is slavery and sin. Paul talks about being enslaved to the law. He doesn't just mean you mindlessly having to try to keep all the laws in the Bible. He also means that in the law, we find out how messed up we are. And in the law, we find out we can never be good enough. And Paul says that law passes away because it has been superseded. It has been all accomplished. It has been finished by Christ on the cross. And so therefore our salvation is totally dependent on Jesus and not by our earthly perfection. So we are no longer slaves to sin. We are slaves to Christ. And if you want to talk about who you want to be a slave to, you don't want to be a slave to Satan. You want to be a slave to the one true God who is a good, good Father. Who one minute we are called to be slaves in Christ, but later on in Hebrews it says we run and we call Him Father. In the prodigal son in the book of Luke around chapter 13, we see God portrayed as a loving Father when His prodigal son leaves and indulges in all kind of crazy living. But when the son comes back and says, Father, I've screwed up so much, I'm willing to be your slave because at least that's better than being a dead free man. And the father says, no, you're my son. Let me give you a new shirt. Let me give you new shoes. Let me put a ring on your finger so everyone knows you are mine. We are free from not only the penalty of sin, but the slavery of sin. We as believers all of a sudden have a choice not to sin. We all of a sudden can run to our Father who's in heaven rather than our Father who was in hell. Because when you belong to Satan, guess what? You are going to follow the ways of Satan. And every person, as soon as they are born, they are conceived in sin is what it tells us in Jeremiah. But at the same time, when we are buried, our old self is gone and the new self has been put on through Christ, all of a sudden we have a new direction to go. We no longer run to Satan when we are shaken, when we are scared. We don't run to sin because it gives us momentary pleasure. We run to the Father who gives us eternal salvation. So Christ's death on the cross took care of our sin's penalty. It took care of slavery and it took care of death. Right here it says we've been united in a death like His. We will certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Verse 5. This is something beautiful. There are many things in this life that bring us trouble. And one of those things that brings us trouble is death. And I don't think it's just so much this idea that you pass away and don't exist anymore like many atheists and agnostics and other people across the world believe. I think one of the most troubling aspects of death is you see it winding down. You see yourself winding down and as you're approaching death you might start thinking about all the regrets you may have, all the things you should have done, all the things you could have done, all the bad decisions you've made. I've never met a person who's lived with no regrets. As though many people say, oh, live a life with no regrets. The only way that's going to happen the only way that's going to happen is your, your salvation is sure in Christ Jesus. Why? Because when you die, you don't stay dead in Christ. When you die, 
you were raised to newness of life with Christ. Because you see, Satan, he used to play the part of master. He used to be the one sitting there watching as we would waste away due to work to the world, due to sin, due to decisions we made, due to our own sinful nature that came all the way from Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2. And he was waiting. He was biding his time because as soon as we died, our souls belonged to him and we awakened in hell. I mean, this is some tough truth, but this is reality. Because we belong to him. The law stated that if we messed up, we belong to Satan. And what happens when everybody messes up? It means everybody belongs to Satan. But right here, Paul says, guess what? That's no longer the case. Christ's death took care of sin, its penalty. It took care of this slavery that we were in bondage from our very beginning. And now, the thing that many people fear for their whole lives, death has been conquered, has been swallowed up in victory by our Lord and Savior Jesus. I mean, that such things had never happened before. Since when do we hear about people coming back from the dead? And I'm not just talking about they die on the operating table and get that and get shocked and come back. We're talking about someone who's been dead in the ground for three days. There was no faking that for three days. Especially because he had Roman guards stationed out for three days. Making sure, do you hear anything? No, I don't hear nothing. He's dead as a doornail, man. Anybody come poking around the tomb? Nah, we've been scaring them off. I mean, we are Roman soldiers. They ain't going to mess with us. Okay, bro. And yet, and yet we see that Christ's death on the cross actually defeats death. They say there are many things in this life that are sure. Death and taxes. Well, Jesus already spoke on taxes. And now he said the final word on death. That it is forever conquered. And listen, we're not just talking about one day we're going to be raised in heaven so you know we've conquered physical death. No, we're talking spiritual death. You ever felt like a dead man walking because of your sin? You ever felt like you're just so covered with it, everybody can see it, and you almost feel like you're dead? You don't even want to go out into the light of day because then everybody will see how miserable you are. You don't even want to mention what's done in the dark, Paul says later in one of his letters, because what is done in the dark is evil and it's hidden. But when it's dragged into the light, when it's dragged into the light, then the truth can come and salvation is here. So we're not just talking about a physical death. Christ has conquered all of this spiritual death that has been permeating humanity from day one. Praise God for His Son who died on the cross for your sins and for mine. But Paul doesn't just explain, hey, here's what you are saved from. He also goes and says, here is what you are saved to. Here is what you need to be excited about. He said, what does unity with Christ look like? First off, he says, guess what? When you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are given a new will. All of a sudden, you're given a new will. Now, when you hear the word will, you might think of two things. Will literally means what you want to do. Basically, you have this urge to do something. Well, we are given a new will when we are becoming children of God. All of a sudden, we no longer have that lust that taste for sin that we used to. Now we have this lust, we have this taste for everything we can of Jesus. We want more of our Heavenly Father than we ever thought possible. All of a sudden we have these strange desires to wake up early on a Sunday morning and go worship even though we might be hurting. All of a sudden we might be wasting away physically because we are nearing the end of our life. But all of a sudden we have a greater desire in our hearts. We have a bigger fire burning within us because we know we are that much closer to seeing our Savior with our own two eyes. Our faith is about to become realized. All of a sudden we no longer think just about what's best for me and what I want. We look across and see our wife and say, you know what, how can I love her better? How can I be the man God wants me to be? We all of a sudden look at our parents and say, man, they don't know a single thing. We look at them and say, God, you have blessed me with parents who demonstrate your love each day to me. God, how can I be the daughter? How can I be the son you have called me to be to my family? We are given a new 
will. All of a sudden, new desires are ignited in our heart. And I'm not saying that all of a sudden the old sins pass away because it is a struggle. That idea of sanctification, it's like appropriation. It keeps coming. The longer you chase after Jesus and the longer He's pulling you by the hand, the more we become like Him. Notice that term like is used a million times in these passages. We are buried like Christ. We are raised to newness of life in Christ. We are raised just like Christ was resurrected. We are becoming more like Him each day. Why? Because we have a new spirit within us. And that spirit directs us in a new will. We have new desires that are popping up. And yet, just like Paul says, we are constantly killing that old one that's been nailed onto the cross. What does unity in Christ look like? All of a sudden, we don't have to live with just terrible desires and sin. We have beautiful desires in Christ Jesus. You know, I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Sometimes people get into this rut and we think the Bible is just a list of do's and don'ts. And you might be getting rid of the Old Testament that talks about, yeah, here's 800 laws to keep. But a lot of people say, well, even if you're a Christian, that means you got to do all these things you normally wouldn't do. It means you got to love people you wouldn't normally love, right? You know, man, isn't that a drag? That person who cuts you off in traffic, you actually got to love them. And not just with American Sign Language, you got to love them. You know? That person who uh, cut in front of you for that promotion at work, you got to love and respect them. Because Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 says, guess what? All of the Old Testament law hinges on two things. Love God, love people. And Jesus got that from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and 8. And you might be saying, wait, wait a minute, man. Those 800-something laws in the Old Testament are starting to sound pretty good because it's hard to love God and love people. You're right. When you're lost, it's impossible. But it's not about works. It's about grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And when we become children of God, when Christ calls out to us and takes hold of us, all of a sudden we have that new will that stokes a fire in our hearts and our soul to go and be who God has called us to be rather than just simply being who Satan wanted us to be. What does unity with Christ look like? Not only do we have a new will, we have a new way. Many of you know that the believers of Jesus were called followers of the way. Guess what? We have a new way to walk. We don't look the same. We don't talk the same. We don't act the same. Not because we're trying to show we are morally superior or physically superior or something like that. But we no longer value the same things we used to. Let's face it. We as humans are pretty selfish creatures. If there's one slice of pizza left in the fridge, left over from last night, we're going to wake up early, not because we like waking up early, but because we want that last slice of pizza because we deserve it more than anybody. But that's selfishness. That's pride. And yet with Christ, we no longer chase that way. We no longer go in that way. When we are raised into newness of life with Jesus Christ, our old self has been crucified on the cross, buried, and now when we're raised up, we're something totally new. That means the path we walk is a different path. You as a believer now have the greatest calling ever given to humanity, and that is to worship God with everything you have. The angels themselves are not given salvation like you have been given. Satan himself tried to usurp God's authority, just like you and I usurp, try to usurp God's authority while we are dead in our sin. And yet Satan is cast down from heaven. We don't see where angels get second chances. But get this, God loves you and I. We who are humans, who are so frail. And scripture says we were made lower than the angels, but higher than the animals. Guess what? God looks at you and says, I want to put in you a new heart. I want to give you a new direction to walk. I mean, what a beautiful life we are given to live on this side of heaven. When, when Christ takes away our sin and puts in us a new song and a new heart and a new way to walk, we no longer have to be the stereotypical selfish human being. We can be that daughter of the King. We can be that child of God. 
who goes forth and loves God with everything we got. And we love people with every fiber of our being. But not only that, it gives us a new destination. We are no longer marching to hell. We are marching onward to the promised land of heaven. You know, this world promises all kind of things. That if we would just give 40 years of our life, then we will accumulate enough money and stuff to make us happy and make us secure. Or maybe if we will just chase after our own heart and our own desires, then we will find fulfillment like no other. But Scripture addresses that. Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, Listen, by the time I was in my 20s, he said, I had more money, more women, more stuff than anybody else in the world. He says, I literally denied my eyes nothing. Because when you're the king, you get whatever the king wants. So Solomon writes whole chapters full of, I got all of what I wanted. But by the time I was halfway through my life, I realized it was all garbage. And he says, the only thing that really matters in this world is following our Lord. And that's God. And get this, Solomon figured that out, that his destination was assured. He knew that if he sought God with everything he had and depended upon the grace of God, he would wind up in a destination that was far more beautiful than any of his countless palaces, that was full of more good things than all of his barns full of stuff. Christian, because of Christ's death on the cross, because of our burial with Christ and raised to freedom in Christ, we have a new destination that will never let us down. And where we are going is so much better than here. And it makes the journey so much better. Have you ever had to go somewhere you didn't want to go and you dreaded the trip? You ever had to go to the doctor's office and you put it off as long as you could until, you know, you're like half dead and have to be escorted by ambulance? You know what I'm saying? Your destination often affects the journey. And the question is, where are you headed this morning? Because if you're a believer and you're headed to heaven, guess what? The de because your destination is assured, you know where you're going, that journey can be a whole lot smoother and a whole lot, full, a whole lot more full of joy and love and peace. But if you don't know where you're going, and you're saying, well, maybe I'm going to go to heaven, maybe I'm going to go to hell, I kind of got to look at my book and balance out, have I done more good than bad? You're living in a state of constant fear. You're living in a state of constant doubt. And you're just hoping and praying that one day you do enough good before you die that everything's going to work out fine in the end. And we've already figured out in Romans 2, 4, and now 6, that's not the case. The only hope is for us to be unified with Christ in His death and in His resurrection. And as it says in Romans, uh, Revelation chapter 7, it says one day we're going to wake up in heaven. We're not going to fear anymore. We're not going to feel the heat of the sun. Our bodies are going to be made new. We will not hunger anymore. And we will not thirst anymore. That is the destination for those who are united with Christ. And the very last thing we're going to talk about is this changes everything. This argument that Paul is making has never been made before. All throughout Scripture it's been, can you keep the law, can you not keep the law? And when Jesus showed up, he talked about the kingdom of God. He said, the kingdom of God has not yet arrived, the kingdom of God is here, and the kingdom of God is yet to come. So Jesus alludes to this idea of sanctification. That yes, you're saved, but you're still struggling with your inner self. And then Paul says, well, I tell you what, I want to expound upon what Jesus was talking about. He's saying that his death on the cross paid the penalty for your sin and mine. So no longer do we have to worry about all these sacrifices to cover up our sin and make us look good before God. Because the sin of Jesus Christ on the cross paid for our sin. And not only that... Because Christ died on the cross and conquered death three days later, guess what? You and I are no longer subject to the dominion of death, as it says in verse 9. Verse 10 says, Christ died uh, to sin. He died for all. And that means the life we live, we live to God. We must also consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And because of that, sin therefore does not reign in our mortal body it cannot make us obey its mortal passions. This argument that Paul has laid out, this truth that he has laid out, 
changes everything. This means that your family no longer has to bear that family curse that comes with your last name. I don't know about you, but where I grew up, a very small town in Tickball, Louisiana, it seemed like every road had a story. You know, I grew up on Benton Road, and that's because my grandparents were Bentons. And so there were certain connotations that came with that last name. My family, my grandparents' family, were the first ones to ever get a car in Tangipo Parish because they were rich. Why were they rich? Because they were running alcohol in times of prohibition. <laughs> Seriously, all right. He's like, yeah, man. That, that, really, and so you would be amazed that even though that was four generations before I showed up, that last name had certain connotations in that area. And so people would look at you based on your last name. And maybe this only happens in Tickfall, Louisiana. Maybe that doesn't happen in Big Point, Escataba, Hurley, Wade, Mississippi. But sometimes people look at your last name or look at the road you grew up on and they say, guess what? They're never going to change. They're always going to be like this. And you know what? They're right. Until Jesus appeared 2,000 years ago and died on the cross for your sins and mine. And that changed everything. No longer are we a slave to those family curses. No longer are, do we not have a choice in the matter. No longer are we slaves to sin, death, and Satan himself. Because we have been given a new will, a new way, and a destination. Christ has taken our old selves and nailed them to the cross. And we are raised in newness of life with him. So we no longer have to be stuck in those old ways. Christ changes everything. And then maybe some of you are saying, well, I don't really have that last name. I'm not from here. But I guarantee you this, everyone in here struggled with some kind of addiction at some point in your life. It might be some kind of uh, addiction of lust. It might be some kind of addiction of painkillers. It might even be the addiction of Big Macs. So, you know, one of those things we don't like to talk about in Baptist churches is overeating. It's like the one sin we kind of gloss over. We just kind of make jokes and wink at each other because we all love casseroles and crockpots. But the reality is... Sin is prevalent in our bodies from the very moment we are born. And from the very day we are born until the day we die, it's like we're floating in between sins. We might conquer one bad habit, but it's like we slide to the next because we are trying to find something who can take care of us. We are trying to find something that brings us comfort, that eases the pain of sin in this world. And yet Jesus is the only one who accomplishes that. And Paul says, guess what? It doesn't matter what sin you've struggled with. It doesn't matter how many times you've run to that for your salvation. Christ changes everything. And get this, people. When Christ changes everything in your heart, He's going to change things in your family. He's going to change things in your community. He is going to change not just your past and present, but your future is forever changed because of the love of Jesus. And by the end of chapter 6, Paul is going to start asking some questions. He's going to say, well, because the wages of sin is death, and because you yourself in the old way cannot fix that sin, what are you going to do now? He starts asking, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul lets his argument rest. He says, so when you're given the option." To let that old body hang around and you live in that. Or you're given the opportunity to follow Jesus and have that newness of life. Which will you choose? Father God, thank you for this morning you've given us.